Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela J. Peters. I am the UCLA American Indian Studies Center event coordinator. As a Diné woman living on Tavang Nar, I would like to open today's event by first recognizing the Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of Tavang Nar. Today, known as Los Angeles throughout the Southern Channel Islands where the American Indian Studies Center and UCLA resides. As a land grant institute, we pay our respects to the ancestors and the relatives relations past, present and emerging and our elders. I feel it's important to acknowledge our tribal relatives homeland and I understand I'm a visitor here as my homeland is a Navajo nation. Welcome to this afternoon's book talk with Jesse Thistle, our Northern First Nation relative. We are excited to host such an outstanding author. For the first portion of this afternoon talk, Dr. Desi Rodriguez Lone Bear, who is an assistant professor of sociology at, and an American Indian Studies Center at UCLA, a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation will engage in a discussion about his autobiography book, From the Ashes. Thereafter, we will open up to discussions to the audience for questions. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box or if you like, either use the raise hand icon or contact me in the chat box and I will unmute you if you have questions directly for Jesse. Please include your name and questions as you speak. Thank you and enjoy this afternoon's event. Um, well, Shift. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Desi Rodriguez Lone Bear. I'm an assistant professor at UCLA in the sociology department and in American Indian Studies. I'm a social demographer by training. Um, I'm a citizen of the Northern Cheyenne Nation and Chicana, and I just introduced myself in my language. Um, I come to you from the lands of the of the Tisistas and the Sutta people, my people, uh, the Northern Cheyenne Nation here in southeastern Montana. I'm very honored to have been asked to moderate this discussion um, with our guest, um, Professor Jesse Thistle. Um, I hope all of you have had the chance to read his book or at least read some of the blurbs and some of the fantastic um, accolades and honors that the book has received. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Mr. Thistle and then uh, the format will be that we'll have um, Jesse's going to read several excerpts from the book. We'll discuss those excerpts um, and kind of get into a, a broader discussion about settler colonialism, indigenous erasure, these structures that continue to traumatize and marginalize indigenous peoples, um, and then uh, kind of wrap it up with um, some ideas about the future and what, what it means to resist and reclaim and to heal. And, um, and open that up again to questions from uh, the audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Jesse. Uh, Jesse Thistle is a Métis Cree from Saskatchewan, Canada. His debut book, From the Ashes, is a memoir about hope and resilience. He is an assistant professor at York University in Toronto and is a PhD candidate in the history program at York, where he is working on theories of intergenerational and historic trauma of the Métis people. He uh, wrote this fabulous book in the middle of his graduate studies, which I think is phenomenal, um, has won the P.E. Trudeau and the Vanier doctoral scholarships, uh, and is a governor general medalist. Jesse is the author of The Definition of Indigenous Homelessness in Canada, which was published through the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. So I'd like for us to also get into some, um, some more detail on homelessness and what it means to be home what it means uh, in an indigenous context and how that we can juxtapose that with the Western definitions of, of home and homelessness as well. Um, he has been published in numerous journals, academic journals. Uh, he has many book chapters uh, and has been featured across uh, Canadian media. Um, this award-winning memoir is the number one bestseller and a CBC Canada Reads finalist and the Indigo Best Book of 2019. And Jesse just told me that he's won a, uh, a large uh, book award here, the Montana High Plains Literary Award as well for this book. So I just wanna say what thumb, which is welcome in my language to, to Jesse. It's, it's such an honor to have you here amongst all of us. And uh, this is one of the most powerful books I have ever read. Um, it speaks to, I think, so much of the trauma that uh, we carry as indigenous peoples um, your story is, you know, many of us 
also share that story in different and yet also similar ways. Um, and so I want to thank you because it, it was a, a very powerful read for me um, and, and likely so many of our students and our faculty and those in the audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Jesse, to, uh, to get us going. Well, thank you, Tansi Cousins. I'm sure I'm related to someone there. Thank you, Desi. It's, uh, I'm glad that people in the States are reading the book. Uh, yeah, I got all these fancy titles and, you know, awards, but really I'm just a storyteller. That's all I am. I'm just a guy, a panhandler, you know, and I, I tell stories and that's what I do. And so I've been, I guess, charged with being um, a knowledge keeper by my elders. And that's part of why I told my story and, and why I'm in academia, uh, which can often be a hostile place for a lot of indigenous peoples. We all know this. Uh, it's hard to stick to our guns and, and follow our teachings, but I'm trying my best to do that. Um, I call myself the accidental author. My book really happened by accident. I was, I'm a graduate student. Uh, I'm an ABD PhD student. And uh, they heard about my life story because um, I won all these major awards. In 2016, I won the top two doctoral awards in our country and uh, the Governor General's Award, which is another really prestigious award all in one month. And they came to do a story about my life. And in that interview, I let it slip that I had this other life uh, that I actually got to university because I was in an effort to get off the streets. I robbed a store where if you read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. And in that violent act, I reversed some of the violence that was perpetrated upon my people. And that's what the opening quote, even though it's a Bible quote, is actually about. Uh, is uh, the, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men uh, use force to get into uh, heaven or something like that, where I had to, you know, do something violent to reestablish myself within the colonial state and have a chance at life. And so um, that's what, who I am, what my book's about and what that quote's about. And the, I'm not all Christian, so don't get all weird and think that I, that's just a really hardcore. It's kind of like Pulp Fiction. You know how he uses Bible quotes in that movie? That's why I use that. So uh, for effect, you know, dramatic effect. Um, I don't know. Do you want me to read a few stories? How do you want this to go? Yeah. So let me, I'll just, um, I'll just say a couple of things and then maybe kind of direct you into the, the beginning. So um, we're going to uh, focus on kind of the beginning, the middle and the end of the book. Um, and we've identified some sections that Jesse will read. Um, but Jesse, you set the stage for your book and the opening poem, Indigenous Affairs. And it describes how you would fish coins out of the Centennial Flame Fountain, which for those of us who are unfamiliar is the fountain in front of the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa. And it's a tribute to the provinces and the territories that are under Canadian control. Um, ultimately, I think it can also be considered a symbol of British imperialism, which necessitated indigenous erasure for it to be successful, which it has been. Um, and so your stealing from the centennial flame was both obviously this physical action that you comment brought you a sense of shame, but it's also a metaphor for so much more. And, uh, and so I think, you know, this book is a metaphor for what that that means that sense of an, of an indigenous person stealing from, uh, you know, this imperialist um, narrative, uh, uh, this violence that has been, um, you know, enacted upon us and this reclamation. And so I guess I want to just open it up by, by asking you to speak more to how your book explores that metaphor um, through this powerful uh, testimony of, of your personal impacts um, with settler colonialism and indigenous erasure, and um, and maybe just start with um, you know one of the early um, one of the early readings to 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 lead us into that. Sure, I could talk about what that poem means and then start. Yeah, because yeah. you you kind of hit the nail on the head there. The the centennial flame fountains full of change, and as a homeless person with addiction issues, suffering from intergenerational trauma because the state tried to erase my people, literally, because we are the rebels that stood up against Canada uh, in 1885. Uh, they were trying to steal our land. 
uh, and we weren't having that. We went to war. And so my intergenerational trauma, which led to my homelessness, actually, um, me kind of subverting some of that power, I guess, would be going there unconsciously and stealing from the Centennial Flame Fountain in front of Parliament as a like, kind of a, an FU to British imperialism. But also, what I didn't realize until much years later when I went back, I went uh, to the very spot where I used to do this. Uh, and there's crests of the territories that are surrounding this uh, fountain. In the spot that I used to sit with my back to the Freedom Tower, it's called, not freedom for us Indigenous peoples, obviously, uh, was the province of Saskatchewan. And why that's significant is because my three times great grandfather, Chief Mistawasis, the Grand Chief of the High Plains Cree, uh, signed into treaty the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta. So literally in that treaty, it says that uh, the government was supposed to take care of his ans his uh, descendants in perpetuity as long as the sunshine and the rivers flow. And here I am three generations later, totally destitute, impoverished, racked with trauma, having to steal. And it's also a microcosm of the way that Canada actually treats Indigenous peoples. We have to steal. We have to, you know, basically we're paupers in our own land. And we're always trying to fight for crumbs when really the state has taken everything from us. So that's what that poem is about. And that's why it's at the beginning. But what I'm going to talk about now is, a, is the intro to my book. It's a, a chapter called Road Allowance. And uh, Road Allowance, really, it's uh, strips of land that my people were dispossessed onto after we lost the Northwest Resistance. And these are strips of land along sides of roads, basically the ditch. Uh, it's called crown land here, a public land. And because we didn't get treaty, uh, we were made to squat in these spaces for 100 years from 1885 all the way up until the time period that's depicted in this book. So I'll just start there. So uh, road allowance. My cookum Nancy's palm felt leathery in mine as I walk as we walked along uh, the side of the train tracks. Stands of poplar swayed and bent in the wind, and she stood still for a second to catch her bearings and watch the flat-bottomed lake's late spring clouds slouch by. <clears throat> she mumbled, then began thrusting her gnarled walking stick into the tall bush ahead, spreading it open, looking for flashes of purple or blue. Purple was a clear sign that the pregnant Saskatoon berry bushes were ready to give birth and ease the winter suffering of bears, birds, and humans. Berries, Cookham said, knew well their role as life givers, and we had to honor and respect that. We did that by knowing our role as responsible harvesters, picking only what we needed and leaving the rest for our animal kin so they could feed themselves and their young. That was our pact, she said, and if we followed it, they'd never let us down. My cookum wear brown, brownish yellow eyeglasses the size of teacups, saucers, her, but her eyes could see, still see things that my three-year-old eyes couldn't. I always tried to search out berry patches before she did, but she always got there first, always. As we waded deeper through the railside grass and reeds, a vast fleet of mosquitoes and gnats lifted from the ditch floor and enveloped our heads. A few flew in my mouth, choking me. I coughed and batted at the air. No, Jesse. Cookham grabbed my arms and held them by my side. They are our relatives. Never do that. I'd never seen her angry before, but she was now. As the black cloud intensified around us, she drew in a deep breath, closed her eyes, and spoke softly in Machif. She pointed to me and her half pail full of berries and then to the rat root plant that protruded out of her dress pocket. Her voice sounded warm like summer air swooshing over the open prairie right before the rain comes and reminded me of when I had accidentally disturbed the hornet's nest beside the smoke shed. There was no anger in her voice then. The plume of insects hovered mid-air for a second, then flew skyward and disappeared, just like the hornets had done. I looked in amazement. 
and my mouth opened, but no sound came out. I strained to hear any buzz buzzing, but there was only the call of a loon far in the distance, followed by the shuffle of Cookham's moccasins. Oh, my silent one, Cookham said. I just told them that we have a job to do. Her brown fa face cracked into a smile. I asked them to visit, visit us later if they must, but for now we have to concentrate. She brushed a few strands of hair from my face and hoisted me over a puddle. Or maybe they're right. Maybe it's quitting time. Let's get back, Chi Garçon. We have enough to make a good bannock. I loved my Cookham's bannock more than anything. Even harvesting with her, listening to her stories or hearing her sing. She made it whenever we visited. We lived in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, about a, an hour's drive from my grandparents. Their cabin was an errand ferry near Debden, just south of Big River, between the old Highway 1 on the one side and the new Highway 55 on the other. The CN rail cut right up the center of the road allowance, connecting Debden to Big River and on to the rest of Saskatchewan. My grandparents' log cabin wasn't like any of the other places that I knew. Mom told us that her dad, Mushum Jeremy Morissette, had made it by hand from the surrounding Aspen hardwood after our family lost our homestead in Park Valley, a few kilometers away. It took him one season to fell the trees, strip them of bark, and build it, and another half season to chink the cracks with mud and moss, waterproof the roof, and make it ready for winter living. Nobody else had a neat house like my Cookham and Mushum, way out in the country in the middle of nowhere with no water or electricity. Mushum said there weren't many people like us anymore, rabbles who fended for themselves. Maybe a few Arcand relatives down the road, but that was about it. The rest had sold out and got farms or went to the city to find work. He didn't own his land. It belonged to the Queen of England. She doesn't mind us being here, Mushum said, and it lets me hunt and trap freely and be my own boss, which I like. He told us stories about how our people had lo once lived in large communities and handmade houses just like his all over Saskatchewan, living off the land, but that was before the government attacked us and stole our land during the resistance, before our clans fell apart. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I tried imagining villages of our peoples living like he and my Cookham did in their little log houses all squished together on little pieces of land owned by the Queen but I couldn't. But there were beaver, muskrat, deer, bears, elk, and fish everywhere, forests, streams, and rivers all around to play in, and no neighbors for miles and miles. If someone tries to push us around, we just pick up and move somewhere else, Cookham said. I mean, Mushum said. We live like this to be free, like our ancestors. I understood that. So that's just the teachings that I'm, I learned from my Mushum and Cookham on the road allowance in Saskatchewan. And I just leave it there because it uh, really introduces my mom and my dad and the dynamic that they had. And uh, really what my Cookham was teaching me was about Wakudu and our relatives or, you know, we're all related, we're, la we're uh, related to, you know, the insects were related to the animals, the berries, there are relatives, and we have reciprocal responsibilities to them all. And so that's what that story is about. And a little bit of our history as, as a proud Machif uh, resistance fighters. And so, uh, yeah, that's that story. And right after this happens, I get uh, me and my brothers get scooped after my family falls apart. And uh, the story starts there where I always try to find the love that I, f I felt on the road allowance. Really, the story is an inverted love story. And what I mean by love is not eros, it's not romantic love. It's the love of community, the love of self, of culture, of family. And that was taken from me and my brothers violently uh, when I was three and a half years old, which happens a lot to Indigenous kids back, back in the 70s, 80s. Even now, it's still happening. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for kind of bringing us into your world, uh, Jesse, and into your family, into understanding that place of love. Um, I think one of the things that I, that was so powerful that you read was this this concept of um, 
what your grandfather said about how we live like this to be free and that concept of freedom. And what does it mean to be free as an indigenous person uh, in you know, this 21st century world uh, in these lands that were always ours, uh, that will always be ours, right? Except for the, uh, the, the centuries of invasion and occupation. Um, and so I think the, the concept of land and, and, and tied to land and home um, is so powerful. Um, and I think maybe, you know, maybe just ask you to talk a little bit about that and then maybe to, to transition to um, where that home was ripped out from under you. Um, sure, sure. So the Métis or Machif are known uh, in Nehea or Cree as the people who own themselves, uh, the uh, Tipawasak people. So we are our own bosses. Uh, it's part of why we went to war uh, because we just didn't want anyone telling us what to do on our own land, right? And so a lot of people think that after the resistance, they destroyed our family kinship networks and our connection to land, right? Because they put homesteads up all across the prairies. They gave the land away from to settlers. They segregated. Uh, indigenous peoples in an apartheid system, the reserve system uh, in Canada. And so really, if you look at my grandparents, my Kukum and Musham and their, grand, and their uh, mother and father, uh, they all fought in the resistance or the, were the generation right after. They were asserting their sovereignty by living outside of the state on these sides of the roads. So you could look at the history of the Métis and say it's full of trauma and darkness and, you know, a lot of like negative things. Or you could look at their choice to live like this as an assertion of their sovereignty, as a way to keep their kin networks together, as a way to continue to hunt and trap as they had, doing, had been doing before colonial invasion. And so through this lens, you know, they're almost like the last free indigenous people in Canada, the Métis, the Machif, right? And so that gives me immense pride, right? They fought for it right to the end, right until modernity squeezed them out. And, uh, you know, my mom's generation is the first generation out of the bush. So that's what that means to me and the, you know, the history that I'm proud of. And the concept of home really, um, to all the indigenous people that I've spoken with is about a connection or an embedment within your relations. Uh, and relations includes the land, includes, uh, you know, the stories of the land, includes your location, includes your kin network and the animals. And so they, in a way, are still uh, on the land and still home. And so really, if you look at my the moment that I become homeless, it's when I get disconnected from the land, right? And this ties into the definition of indigenous homelessness that I'll talk about later in the lecture or the, the talk, but it's central to the whole theme of the book. This notion of homelessness as an indigenous person isn't just about not having a place to live, right? Thank you. Um, should we go into the Red Baron to kind of set that that stage for your, your own? Oh. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to read um, a little bit about that. Okay. Okay. And I won't tell you what it's about until I'm a little, until after. Okay. So it's called Red Baron. Dad didn't come home again last night. Josh said, that's my brother. As he jumped off the top bunk, thudding on the wooden floor, he began rocking his lower bunk. Uh, it's rusty springs squeaked with each push. Jerry, my other brother, groaned and pulled the covers over his body, exposing my legs. The chill of the morning air through the holes in my mighty mouse PJ bottoms jolted me wide awake. Jerry took up three quarters of the bottom bunk, which I shared with him, but that was okay. Even if I only got the outside sliver of the mattress to sleep on because his body was warm and soft and reminded me of a teddy bear. I yawned and rubbed my stomach. I know, Josh said. That's why I'm trying to get you up. Dad took off with all the change when he woke up. <clears throat> he said he'd come back with food, but he hasn't. He shoved the bunk again, this time hard enough to wake Jerry, who let out a fart. 
He lay on his side, still curled into a ball, his mouth and chin covered in drool. A pool of it drenched the pillow below. Jerry's crusty eyes blinked open and he looked toward the living room. Where's dad? He sounded angry and annoyed. I don't know. Josh threw up his hands and we've got no food again. I could hear Jerry's stomach grumble as he sat up slowly with the blanket tight around his shoulders. It looked like a cape. I watched as the World War I airplanes that decorated its fuzzy surface folded and contorted and collided into one another. I imagined mid-air explosions all across his back. I knew there were fighter planes because Dad told us they were. He said the ones with the black crosses on the tail were the Germans, the bad guys, and the ones with the blue, white, and red bullseyes were the British, the good guys. I love the story of the Red Baron and always imagined myself in his three-winged plane shooting down Canadian ace Roy Brown. The Baron's plane was cooler than, the, than Brown's by a long shot. Both the Baron's Red Fokker D1 triplane and Brown's Sopwith Camel buzzed around Jerry's neck when he stood up and shuffled into the kitchen. He slammed the cupboard doors in frustration and collapsed on the floor, crying. I'm hungry, he wailed repeatedly. Josh abandoned me. Don't cry, Jerry, he said, going to him and rubbing his back. We're going to go over to the store and get some food like last week. He looked over at the window I knew faced the convenience store. With all three of us out there, we'll get all kinds of food. It'll be fun. Josh went to the fridge and grabbed one of the half-drunk beers and gave it to Jerry. Brown pop, here, drink it. Jerry dropped the blanket and took the bottle with both hands. He scrunched up his face, put the bottle to his lips, tilted his head back and swallowed. I pictured him drinking a magic potion. Jerry is the toughest of us all, I thought. Gross, Jerry let out. He hated brown pops and never drank them when dad gave them to us but he knew it would fill him up. He handed the empty back to Josh, who went to place it under the kitchen sink with the others. When he opened the door, cockroaches scurried into the darkest corners of the cupboard. We also got this, Josh said as he walked back to the fridge, a glimmer of enthusiasm in his voice. The turnip he pulled from the crisper was as big as his head, and the thump it made when it hit the floor shook our apartment. It sounded like a bomb went off. Josh rolled the clumsy boulder over to the edge of the wharf, war planes, hitting Jerry's foot. Dad said we could eat this. I know we tried before, but we gave up way too easy, Josh said. I waddled over to the vegetable, wondering how it would fit in my mouth. Josh pulled a knife out of the drawer and sat down and began to hack at the turnip. Flecks of white and hard yellow the size of pennies flew in all directions as Josh whacked away at it. I put one of the white pieces in my mouth and bit down, but my teeth couldn't meet all the way. I chewed away. It tasted like nothing, but I swallowed anyways. I rubbed my fingers along my bottom teeth, and they were covered with wax, with a waxy film. Jerry picked up a yellow piece and chucked it in his mouth. The click of his jaw told me the yellow parts were harder, way harder than the white ones. He folded his arms and spat it out on the ground. It's worse than the brown pops. It's like a rock. I can't eat that. Josh's blade paused a second as he took a big yellow piece and placed it in his mouth. He tried to look like he was happy, enjoying eating it, but we could tell it was torture. The muscles on the side of his head flexed and bulged. He spat it out and agreed with Jerry totally unedible. There was a loud knock at the door. Boom, boom, boom. Josh gently placed the knife on the ground and put his hands over our, both of our mouths. Be quiet. He mouthed and made a shush shape with his lips. The battle scarred tur turnip rocked back and forth, threatening to give us away. Another knock assaulted the door. Boom, boom, boom. Open up, a voice boomed. It's the police. We know you boys are in there. Josh's eyes widened, and he grabbed the sh my shirt and pulled me toward the wall as if he didn't know where to go. Jerry shot up, tossing the blanket on the floor. Come with me. 
he said as he launched me and Josh into the bedroom. We skidded, we skidded over to Jerry's hiding spot, a large vent, air vent in our room that he'd discover when we'd first moved in. When he showed it to Dad, he was impressed with how much room there was inside. Jerry told him how he'd used a penny to turn the screws at the corners to take the grate off and how the shaft went straight 12 feet and then turned to the right. Smart lad, Dad said. He, tried, he, he had tied a string to the back of the grate. Now when someone comes, and I mean anyone, you all pile in here and just pull this string. It'll close the vent behind you. Got it? Jerry nodded and tried it out. The first couple times the cover went on crooked or sideways or not at all. Eventually though, with enough coaching from dad, Jerry could pull it closed in a second or two. From the outside, it was hard to see the string or that the screws weren't holding the grate on. Boom, boom, boom. The knocks at the door turned into what sounded like powerful kicks. It was only a matter of minutes before the door gave way. Hurry. They're coming, Jerry said, as he pulled the grate off and ran my head through the vent opening. He kicked my bum to hurry me up. A wall of warm air, a warm, dry air slammed into my face and arms as I flew down the shaft. Shaft. Josh was right behind me, pressing his face into my ass. He shoved me further down the shaft towards the darkness. Go, 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 he commanded in a frantic but hushed voice. Faster, 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 crawl faster, Jesse. The more we wiggled, the more our bodies dented the tin walls. It sounded like thunder all around my head. I began to cry. I looked back and could see Jerry pull the string closed. The gate, the grate slapped into place in one shot. Perfect, just like Dad had taught him. We covered our mouths to silence our breath dust settling all around us. Boom, boom, boom. I could hear the front door burst open and footsteps stampede into the living room. It sounded like a herd of bison stampeding that I'd seen on the nature shows. Look at this, I heard one man say. The kitchen is full of trash. Hey, look, called another out from the bathroom, his voice echoing off the talls. There are rigs and gear in the tub. Check it out. One voice stood out from the rest, and I could tell he was in charge. Yup, just like the neighbor described. Dope and children, find them. The violent crashing sound of cupboard doors was followed by the clanking of empty beer bottles. Jesus, a deep voice said from near the, the kitchen. They've been hacking up this turnip. They got no food. I heard them go into Dad's room, and then more noise. Nothing in here but skin magazines. A pair of black boots appeared in front of the vent and someone bent down to look under the bed. It was a police officer. I could just see his uniform past Josh and Jerry's bodies. Nothing in here, he said, as he shone his flashlight into the vent. His voice was higher and younger than the rest. But the pillow is wet. They must have just left. Not possible, the voice in charge said. The lady next door watched him leave last night at 10.30 and the kids were inside. She said she saw them when she peeked in from the door across the hall. She said they beg for food out in front of the store or the arena. We checked both locations and they weren't there. That means they're here. They're still here. Look harder. I don't know, Sarge. We checked everywhere. It's a tiny apartment. Where else could they be? Jerry's arms were shaking as the pair of black boots readjusted in front of the vent. A radio chattered as Josh squirmed. The tin made a muffled knock under his arm. Wait a minute, the voice said. I think they're in here. The front of the vent shifted as he dug his fingers under the grate and tried to pull. Jerry gritted his teeth and held it tight with all his might. They're in the vent. I can see them, but they've got it locked off somehow. The herd of black boots entered the room as the young officer's eye peered in to get a better look. Yup. He smiled and put his palm up to the vent holes. I was shaking and I could feel Josh was too. It's okay, fellas. Nothing to be afraid of. Move out of the way, the lead voice barked and the grate was ripped off. A huge meaty hand with hair on it reached in and pulled Jerry out. Then Josh and me, my Mighty Mouse PJs ripping on the screw in the opening. Jerry and I were shaking and crying. I couldn't speak. The string had rubbed Jerry's palms raw as it was torn from his grasp. 
Blue and red lights flashed against the ceiling of our bedroom. Dad is going to kill us, I thought. Josh began to cry. He probably was thinking the same thing. The officer who found us bent down and smiled. Which one are you? He asked Josh as he dusted the lint off my brother's shoulder and wiped his tear. Josh just glared at him and kept his mouth shut, the dust on his face now smeared back to his ear. A kind-looking black woman with a clipboard emerged from behind the young policeman. I could smell her fruity perfume. It made me hungry. She knelt down in front of Jerry. We are going to take you somewhere safe. There's no need to be afraid. Jerry pushed her away and crossed his arms. Hmm. She nodded to the police and they scooped us up. As the officer carried me out of the apartment, I looked over his shoulder and saw my blanket sitting on the kitchen floor. It had half covered the turnip and some empty beer bottles. I could see the edge of the Baron's triplane and I imagined myself flying it higher and higher into the sky up near the sun. So that's a story about how we were scooped from the care of my father. He had his own addiction issues. Uh, he's got lines of trauma. Uh, he's part Algonquin from Northern Ontario and uh, he's part Scottish from uh, the Cape Breton Highlands. And that's a brutal history that the British imperialists did to the Gales. And so his uh, trauma manifested in his life in addictions. And, uh, you know, uh, he, as the story depicts, wasn't very, a very good father, maybe shouldn't have been one. And uh, that's what a scoop looks for an Indi uh, indigenous uh, child from the inside. And that's why I wrote that he scooped us up. And from that, we went into CAS for a few months and it wasn't a positive experience. It was very bad, especially for my brother, Jerry. Uh, you'll have to read the book to find out what happened. And uh, I don't tell the reader while I am describing these changing of scenes, but if you do read my book, I want you to question why did they call my white grandparents in Toronto? and not my indigenous mom, right? I don't say that, but I couldn't say that because it's my memoir, I didn't know that. I figured that out years later in my 30s, but someone in child services had made that call. And so that's that's what that story is about. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Jesse. I think it speaks to, um, you know, off, uh, throughout this book, what became very clear was this history of trauma that um, has impacted, you know, your father and then your mother and then your maternal grandparents and your paternal grandparents and how this trauma um, has uh, impacted the ability, uh, their ability to parent. Um, and, and I see that across Indian country. Um, I see it in my own family, in my, in our, in my own community. Um, I hear my elders talk about, you know, um, we need to remember how to be parents again. How, but how do you do that if you didn't have parents to teach you that? And if they didn't have parents to teach them that? And so we see how this cycle of intergenerational trauma has resulted in generations of children, right? Neglected and abandoned and hurt. Um, and so that chapter to me was so poignant in the sense that your personal experiences and those of your, of your brothers um, speak to, um, you know, generations of indigenous children across the world, not just in Canada, not just in the US, um, but this notion of scooping, of being removed by, you know, um, a state authority into some to someplace safe. Um, for those of you who have read and for those of you who hopefully will read, you know that the experiences of Jesse and his brothers in, uh, in, in, in under the you know, security of the state was not safe you know, um, what happened to his brothers and him, it, you know, is something that um, so many of our children in foster care have experienced, that abuse um, in all of its forms, and how that really sets the trajectory for our lives as Indigenous adults. Um, and so I want to transition to your life as an adult, Jesse, and, and how, um, uh, or I guess let's start with, with your life, um, I guess, when you went under the care of your grandparents, um, your your white grandparents, um, 
Yeah. You talked a lot about, um, you know, the negative experience with the educational system, the racism that you experienced and how that kind of uh, turned you to, uh, you know, your, uh, there was a lot of fighting, you know, you felt like you had to fight to kind of survive. Um, you described what that looked like. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of young indigenous people can identify with is this, this conflict of our identities. You know, who are we? Who are we in these urban areas, in these cities? You know, are we, how do we um, identify when so much of what makes our identity as indigenous peoples meaningful has been taken from us? Um, much of that is not our fault. Um, I was really taken by your, uh, your section on the fake Italian, and yes. uh, perhaps you could read a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, Desi said it, like, uh, being dislocated is uh, in such a violent way, I was traumatized, and a lot of the teachers uh, in school didn't identify me because they weren't trauma informed and they didn't the ignorance in Canada at that time of to indigenous people's histories. And so I was labeled as a troublemaker or a fighter or someone that lashed out when really I was just trying to express myself and I had no way to, you know, explain the disappearance of my father, why I was at my grandparents and getting hit, uh, why the other kids around me were making fun of me all the time and why I always had to fight. I literally fought every day in grade school. And this is a very common experience, as Desi saying, like uh, for Indigenous youth that are dispossessed and adopted out. Uh, that where I grew up was majority white. And this story is actually about a strategy that I started employing when I'm around eight or nine years old, which is really sad now that I think about it, uh, about me hiding who I was. It's called the fake Italian. Leroy, that was my best friend. He was a Newfie. Newfies are cool Canadians. I just want you guys to know that. Uh, Leroy kicked his leg over the blue bin behind the convenience store and disappeared inside. We dove in every other week and we'd find Playboy magazines, old gum, and maybe some candy bars. It was a good little after school activity that kept us busy. People thought Leroy and I were brothers. We were together so much except I looked like some awkward mix of Italian and something else, and he looked whiter than a bleached bedsheet. Derek, the small Greek kid who lived across the street from my grandparents, was with us, and he was the darkest kid around, darker than even Josh. I thought I looked like Derek and his father a bit. Score, Leroy said, and held out a porno mag over the edge of the bin, and Derek and I cheered. Anything else? Derek asked. I heard what sounded like boxes shuffle and bags ripped, followed by Leroy saying, we hit the mother load, boys. He tossed out a dusty box of Snickers and climbed out. Check the expiry date, I said, as I searched the side and found the label March 1984. Must be from the back room or something, Derek said as he examined the label and ripped open the box. He had a bar unwrapped in, in his mouth in a matter of seconds. As he tried to gnaw at the brown steel, the skin of the bar cracked and broke. That shit's three years old, I said. Don't break a tooth. Leroy stood transfixed near the edge of the bin. He was gawking at the skin mag. He flipped it around and showed us a picture of a naked woman lying down in the desert. She had on feathers and leather buckskins. Bits of her costume hung Luke, loose and revealed her breasts. Your people, he said, laughing. I didn't know what to say and picked up a Snickers bar and attempted to snap it in half to see, it was, see if it was edible. It didn't flex a millimeter. I wasn't putting it in my mouth. Derek giggled and moved closer to get a better look. He said, my brother told me about Indians. His mouth was full of chocolate as he looked over me and tossed uh, the wrapper to the ground. He said that they're all dead. Leroy held the magaz magazine up and smiled. She's not dead. The woman in the pictures was now completely naked but was beside a painted horse and she had a spear in her hand. It's in that Iron Maiden song, Derek said. Run to the hills. My brother plays it all the time. Yeah, Leroy added, my sister too. I, I love that song. 
both broke out into the lyrics holding Derek holding his hands in a heavy metal de devil horns Leroy headbanging his mullet I could make out that the song was about killing Indians and selling them whiskey and destroying the buffalo the only clear part was the chorus the same as the title run to the hills I assumed it meant that the Indians had to run away I thought about it when Derek's brother Moses played that song on the ghetto blaster in front of his house. I heard the name Cree in the lyrics, and Moses explained to me that it was about when the British Army killed a bunch of Cree Indians on the plains out west and then gave the land to the white people. You're from out west, Moses said. Are you a Cree? I didn't know what to say and wondered if my mom was a Cree for a second. No, I blurted out we're Italian. The lie came from nowhere, but I thought it might keep me safe or include me somehow. We have some Indian way back, I went on, but my skin is dark because we have Italian in us. See? I held my arm to his. That's not what your brother Josh said. He gave me a skeptical look. I thought about my parents and all the questions that had burned within me growing up and the resentment that had taken root. I hated them. And I hated myself. I hated explaining to the other kids where my parents were and why my skin was darker than theirs. I felt torn between wanting to be Indian and wanting to hide in my lie. Kind of how I felt there, standing there, listening to Derek and Leroy thrash to that song by the dumpster with the naked woman in the magazine dressed like an Indian. It would just make life easier, I decided, to tell people that I was Italian. So that's about the internalization, like if you want to talk about like uh, the internalization of um, negating your own identity, uh, Franz Fanon talks about this. That's the final stage of colonialism. When you look in the mirror, literally, and you don't even see yourself, you see a white person or a colonial person looking back at you and kind of chokes me up to think about that because that was one of the most painful things to deny who I was. And that didn't re return till many, many years later, where I could be proud of who I was. So, thank you, Jesse, for that. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to essentialize it and make sweeping broad statements, but um, I think many Indigenous peoples have a similar experience, you know, of negating who we are um, for survival, um, you know, uh, to fit in, to to not have to ask, answer so many questions perhaps. And I think that that experience in adolescence um, has such a tremendous impact, right? On, um, on your identity, you know, moving into an adult. And, and um, so I just, I just found that um, such a powerful short chapter because it really speaks to how the erasure of, of who we are as indigenous peoples is ongoing. It's an ongoing yeah. project. It has continued. Um, it is impacting our kids just as it impacted us and our grandparents and our parents. Um, and so um, thank you for that. Um, so I want to move us into um, this long chapter of your life um, where the trauma, right, um, this experience of, of the neglect and, and of uh, the abuse and of, of the erasure of your identity and, and all of that um, led you into this life that you lived for many years um, of, a, of an addict uh, on the streets. Um, and uh, that's such a powerful testimony that I think, um, uh, I just, I don't wanna spend too much time on it because I think I want us to also ensure that we have time at the end to talk about healing and reclamation and of, sure, of sure. so, um, if you would do us the honor of perhaps reading um, a short bit, um, let's start with the Canadian streets, greasy with indigenous fat, 189. Sure. Yeah, so um, my homelessness, addiction issues, and criminality, I'm, you know, I used to be a jailbird, uh, was actually the maturation of 150 years of, of, of trauma, right? And it got worse over time, you know? took my dad away, my mom, my dad, they all suffered. But for me, it was absolute homelessness, destitution. Uh, not proud of the way I lived that way, but I had to tell the truth of what actually had happened to me. 
And so while I was writing my these traumatic memories, I got kind of angry at the state. I'm like, you know, screw you, yeah, Canada, for doing this to me and my family. And for me having to live like this for like all these years. And so I started looking at the colonial history of like glo global colonialism. And I saw that the last time that Europe was was colonized by an outside force was actually the Mongolians in the 12th and 11th century. Genghis Khan, right, conquered like Russia and parts of like Poland and stuff. And I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to look at some of their literature and I'm going to flick that back on the state. And so I, I went to what's called the secret history of the Mongols. And uh, it's, it's uh, the origin story of the Mongol hordes and where they actually come from. And so I applied that to my own life and I inverted that colonial violence that was inflicted on me in this poem and no one's really caught on to it and I'm telling you guys explicitly here so you're getting kind of like a sneak peek of what I was actually thinking when I was writing it it's called Canadian streets greasy with indigenous fat the secret history tells us once a blue wolf arose from the soil he took as his mate a fallow deer there at the head of the sea a son was born Descendants of that sun traveled light upon the grasslands, using speed and surprise. They learned to own nothing, to adapt to all conditions and burning dry dung for warmth. From out of the eastern sunrise, these homeless nomads rode. On horseback they came, setting everything ablaze. They littered the stolen streets with their bodies and let, left them greasy with their own fat. And so that's about really the phenomenon of indigenous homelessness. And you could say that that's actually the very front lines of colonialism uh, because they're racked with indigenous uh, trauma passed down because everything was stolen from us. Like, and that's why our bodies are cast upon the streets. And, and it's actually a very, very dark appreciation of what happened to me and my, my people as well as the other indigenous people that I saw out in the streets with me, so. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you for that. Um, one of the most powerful and most beautiful things I think about your book, Jesse, is um, how you have woven your poetry together with your prose and 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 your stories. And and I found the, um, you know, the, the poetry itself is 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 just so beautiful and uh, and and poignant. So thank you for reading that brief um, that brief poem. Um, I know we want to talk a, a bit about homelessness and and. Um, Maybe we'll, do you want to do that now or do you want to do that following inception? No, we can talk about it now. Let's do that. So I know you've talked about in Canada, you know, Indigenous peoples are eight times more likely to be homeless than non-Indigenous peoples. Um, our rates are similarly high here in the United States, particularly in urban areas. You know, the majority of Indigenous peoples no longer live on reservations, much like in Canada, they no longer live on reserves. Um, we're in urban areas. Um, you know, forcibly, we have, uh, uh, you know, been uh, removed yeah. from our homelands, you know, um, and, uh, and so I want to, to ask you to, to, to expand a little bit more on what home means in an Indigenous worldview um, and what homelessness means. I know you've come up uh, with uh, a very, very important definition of Indigenous homelessness that, uh, that the state of Canada has adopted that I think has uh, a lot of... Uh, opportunity for intersection in other in other nation states yeah uh yeah great thank you for asking me about my more important research than my book this is probably the most important thing that i've ever done or will do in my life uh i wrote the definition of indigenous homelessness in consultation with community members and other indigenous peoples that have experienced homelessness themselves or work in the field of homelessness uh so that's the precursor from where we consulted. We also looked at literature that came out of Australia and New Zealand and the US uh, to see how Indigenous peoples articulated homelessness in those states. And what we found actually uh, was that uh, Indigenous homelessness is not about not having a structure of habitation to live in. That sounds crazy, right? Being homeless is not about having like a place to sleep in. 
That's the, that's the Western idea of what homelessness is, right? And so from the literature that we drew from and from the people that we talked to, we found that Indigenous homelessness really is about broken relationships over time due to colonial interruption. So your relationship to land, your relationship to your kin, to your worldview, right? And an egalitarian worldview, connection to creator. This has all been replaced by Judeo-Western hierarchical way of seeing like man as dominant over nature and then they could do whatever they want to it. And we argue in this definition that all those severing of our relations, what we call all my relations or Wakudawin up here, is what's producing indigenous houselessness. So if you look at how I was scooped out of my relative's house off the road allowance when I'm three years old, my houselessness that happened when I was 20 really started, my homelessness started when I was three and a half years old, when I'm scooped, because that ended my connection to my community, to my culture, to my worldview, to my land. And when we went around and talked about this to Indigenous people all across the country, they all agreed. They're like, this is what we talked to the elders, like, this is what we're seeing. It's been articulated now. And different governments, provincial governments have adopted it. There's different cities that are adopting it. We tried to get the federal government to adopt it. But of course, they're, you know, they're the feds. And so they're a little harder to convince, but we're working on it, right? And so this has gone on to transform not only indigenous homelessness understandings, but the way that elder homelessness works, the way that um, veterans homelessness works. They go over, they fight for war, they come back, all their social relations are destroyed in that process to become homeless, right? Especially among like Vietnam vets and stuff. We saw the same phenomenon. So what this all means is that indigenous knowledge is now indigenizing the housing sector. It's true indigenization. It's not like they just hired me as a token indigenous person on their team and then they say they're indigenous. No, they're changing the way they're thinking and, and writing policy through this definition. So, And all the different dimensions actually appear in my book. I don't talk about them explicitly. There's 12 actual def, uh, uh, domains of indigenous homelessness or dimensions. Uh, that articulate this this harmful disconnection through colonial interruption. Uh, so that's what that is. And I hope I didn't lose everybody. I got a little technical there, but <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I think it's so it's it's important that we talk about, you know, how, you know, the experiences that we live as indigenous peoples, um, are circumscribed by these structures, right? These structures that um, are uh, continue to um, affect um, trauma and, and that continue to marginalize. And we have to dismantle those structures and those systems. Um, and this is how we do that. And so it's a great example of that, um, of how you're you're doing that act, that hard work. Um, uh, so thank you. So let's move on to. Um, we just we don't have too much time left, but I, I want to get to two more sections. Um, inception, if you would, um, and then we'll oh, okay. We'll do you, do you okay. want to, or it's up to you? Um, it's really up to you, Jesse. What well, you'd like? Yeah, maybe we could go to Indian turn Métis. Yeah, let's do that. It, yeah. So we're gonna go to Indian turn Métis. All right, thank you. Okay, so. The chapter she was talking about inception i can give you kind of like the uh, the dirt cheap and dirty version of it i go to jail and i see a guy on the range and he's studying and i always wanted to get to be able to read properly i uh, from not being uh identified as a child a child that had trauma i just never learned to read in grade school properly and that followed me all the way through to when i was in prison one of the last times and i saw a guy doing his ged so I call it inception because that's the inception of my new life where I, I, I worked with the Salvation Army chaplain and did my GED, part, part of my GED in there. Part of that journey through education, education is actually what saved me, education and love with my wife. Uh, when I came out of rehab, Lucy was there and uh, I made a promise to my grandmother when she was in the oncology ward, this is the woman that raised us when we went to Brampton. Uh, that I would stop being an idiot first. I didn't put that in the book, but she said, you got to follow through with this education thing, Jesse, and you got to go all the way with it. 
And so I worked for a couple of years and Lucy kicked my ass and made me honor my promise to my grandmother. And I went to university. And when I was in there, I was called, I was white knuckling it, right? I'm a former crack addict and alcoholic. I just wasn't getting sober. I was just dry for like a year and I needed to get to the root of what was driving my addictions. And part of that was discovering myself as an indigenous person and being proud in who I was. So I started taking indigenous history courses. And in those courses, oddly enough, I re-indigenized myself. And that's what this, I discovered that I wasn't an Indian at all. I'm Métis, Métis Cree. And I learned about this really cool history I'm gonna share with you. So it's called Indian Turn Métis. I started taking indigenous history courses to figure out who I was and why I, wa I saw so many other natives in all the homeless and justice institutions and out on the streets over the years. I thought maybe I might be able to get some answers in my classes or readings and understand why I had made so many poor life choices and to keep from relapsing. It was a long shot, but I had to try. For one of my first assignments, one of my professors, Dr. Victoria Freeman, asked us to look at our family history within the context of Canadian colonization. Since my grandma and Brampton hardly ever talked about her native background, I called my mom to ask her questions. We're mischief rebel fighters, she said. Canadians call us Métis. I recognize that word mischief from when we'd all been talking in Aunt Cecile's kitchen at Josh's wedding. Your great-grandmother, Marianne Ledoux, Mushroom Jer uh, Jeremy's mother, is related to Louis Riel, mom said. But talk to your Auntie Vaughn. She's the family historian. When I called Auntie Vaughn the next day and asked her about her involvement with Riel, she could hardly contain herself. Oh, my boy, I've been waiting a very long time for you to get interested in who you are, she said. A lifetime, actually. She asked me to hold on while she turned on her computer to access her genealogy files. I'm addicted to Ancestry.ca, so if I get a little strung out on the call, just send over the blue bus to take me away, she cackled, and her laugh stirred up a memory of, her of our place in Moose Jaw after our dad ran away in 1979. She was taking care of us when mom went to work, off to work and tucking us in. I'd never remembered that before. Let's see, she said. It sounds like she was slurping a drink of something. Ah, here, the Morissette family line. I'll email you the link so you can explore it yourself. If I try to explain it, you may need to go back into rehab, she said, cackling again. But I could tell she was serious. The picture I sent is of Chief Mistawasis, a Cree chief. He's your three times great-grandfather. I remember Derek's brother, Moses, asking me, what I was when we were growing up. So we are Cree, I thought. I checked my email, there up on my screen appeared a big black and white picture of an old man sitting with other old Indian men. The caption read, Cree chiefs Atakako and Mr. Wasis. I examined the medals around their neck and then minimized the image and clicked the link. A huge family tree appeared hundreds of ancestors with pictures, names, dates, and places of birth beside each box, box that represented each ancestor. Many had feathered bonnets on, like Plains Indians from the movies. Others looked like old cowboys, and others were just dressed in regular clothes. Your Cree and road allowance machif, Jesse, you come from a long line of chiefs, political leaders, and resistance fighters. Auntie's voice glowed like fire and lit my curiosity. I went through the photos faster and faster, trying to drink in the rushing river of information. Those of the Cree chiefs fascinated me the most. They were strong and epic in appearance, in their beaded buckskins, feathered headdresses to the ground, and spears in hand, many on horseback and surrounded by warriors. But they looked staged. Then I saw pictures of my cookum Nancy and Mushum Jeremy and their little shack near the tracks and felt a lump in my throat. I hadn't seen an image of them in nearly four decades. 
below those was a battlefield picture with the heading Batosh. And underneath it was that blue flag with the infinity symbol I'd seen when I had the fever after my operation. What's this battle, Batosh, and what's this flag, Auntie? I asked. Visions of the western door and the horses and the fear I'd felt welled in my chest again, but I fought it against it now with my auntie on the line. Oh, that's where our family fought for our land during the resistance when Canada attacked us. And that's our flag, the, Ma the Métis flag. The report of Gatling guns thundered in my soul. The face of the Indians I'd been in with the rifle pit in my dream came to me. I searched the family tree and couldn't find him, but I remembered that Iron Maiden song Leroy and Derek sang near the dumpster. Could this be part of the same conflict? I thought. I searched the pictures and saw the same columns of red coats near the large river charging up the same slope of hill towards the same white church. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was real. I stayed on the phone for a half hour with Auntie Vaughn, and she explained how our people had fought and been pushed off our land around Batash, Saskatchewan after 1885 and were made to squat on public crown lands on the sides of the roads and railways. Known as road allowances, land nobody owned or wanted. The Métis weren't taken care of with treaty like First Nations people with reserves, but cast off to wander unprotected and dispossessed. We were the forgotten people. The waist-high grass along the old highway in northern Saskatchewan rustled as wind blew up from the south. I took my camera out and snapped a photo of the now deteriorating rail line running from Debden up to Big River. Its steel bed snaked up over the crest of the hill, then disappeared into the shrubs and thistles. I couldn't trace where my cookum took me berry picking, but knew it was somewhere around here. Standing beside me were my mom, Auntie Vaughn, and Dr. Carolyn Padruchny, a York University professor and expert in, York, in uh, Métis history. I'd met Carolyn after Dr. Freeman marked my family history paper. This is one of the best papers I've read all year, uh, Fre Dr. Freeman said. I think you need to meet a friend of mine. Two weeks later, I was at Carolyn's office in York University, York University's history department, a binder of Annie Vaughn and my own genealogical research in hand. Yvonne was right. Genealogy was addictive, but in the best possible way. I learned quickly that Carolyn hadn't read my paper, but she wanted to know my family history. After some explaining, she said she knew exactly who my mother's people were. Arcand, Morissette, Montour, some of the major resistance Métis fighting clans, bison hunters, and road allowance families in the northern parkland belt in Saskatchewan. She agreed to take me on as a student. You'll do an independent reading course, she said, adding that she'd hire me as a research assistant on her social sciences and humanities research council project tracing Métis history through archives, which involved field work at various Métis historical sites in Saskatchewan. I was thrilled. It meant I'd see my mother and our people in our homelands, where I hadn't been since I was three. Carolyn flew me home in June of that year. It felt so good to hung, hug my mom after so many years. I don't think I mustered any words in the airport, I let my tears do the talking. We growled like wolves the same way Josh and she did years ago in my grandparents' doorway. Carolyn clapped her hands in excitement. For two weeks, Carolyn and I, along with my mom and Yvonne, drove all over the province to interview about a dozen Cree and Métis elders, visiting historical sites relevant to the 1885 resistance, including Batash. Many of the elders told us they'd never shared their history with outsiders before. Given their traumatic history and treatment by the Canadian government, it was understandable. The road allowance where my Cookham and Musham lived was the last stop on our research trip and my quest back to my identity. The land stretched back about an acre from the old road right over to the train tracks. I recognized the ash and poplar trees off in the distance. 
bending and moaning as they arched over the now derelict property. Mom wandered ahead of us to the old smoker, a shack where my grandparents used to smoke moose, bear, and deer meat. There was nothing but a few rotten pieces of wood where it once stood. Aunt Yvonne hiked toward two depressions in the grass and pointed to the ruts. You can still see where the cars and carts used to drive up, doctor. Carolyn batted the mosquitoes buzzing around her head as she struggled through the overgrown grass. I limped alongside her like usual, but en energy radiated up my legs. I was stepping on ground I hadn't tread in 37 years. And it was like the road allowance remembered me. The prairie roses all across the property appeared to be smiling at me, welcoming me home, waving their heads this way and that. Aunt Yvonne motioned her hand over another depression some 30 by 60 feet with small shrubs and trees growing within it. Fauna not as tall as the surrounding forest. This is where they lived, ma père and mon, mon, ma mère and mon père. She looked at me and her black eyes seemed to hug right around my whole body. Carolyn turned to face me. She too had eyes as big as moose tracks in the snow. I stepped within the depression of the building and fell to my knees. The smell of lard and my cookum, cooking bannock washed over me. I heard cookum singing to the hornets and mosquitoes, lulling them away as we picked berries. The sweet sound of the Morissette reels my mushum played throbbed in my ears. The flicker of moonbeams on his vest danced across my eyes. The faint scent of smoke from my cookum's hearth wafted across the air. I saw my mushum whittling a toy sword. I remembered them. I remembered my mother's people. I remembered who I was. Well, thank you, Jesse. I think that's a beautiful way to end um, thinking about, you know, the the childhood, um, the childhood stories that you've shared are not uncommon amongst Indigenous peoples, but I think the healing and the kind of ascension that you have achieved um, in many ways is, um, you know, I think we, um, we see so many of our relatives still struggling in these cycles of intergenerational trauma. Um, and, uh, and so, um, I just, uh, I thank you for writing these words. I think they are healing words uh, for many of us. Um, I was talking to PJ about this earlier that I, I had a hard time finishing this book because um, it was through a lot of tears. Um, and so I want to thank you. Um, and I hope all of you on the call um, took something good from this, um, took something powerful, um, how, you know, that you're leaving with an understanding of um, the way that these structures of settler colonial violence continue to harm and traumatize, um, but that there is healing as well. Um, and that there's healing in our, our identities and the strength of our relationships, right? Um, and overcoming uh, so much of that pain and trauma. Um, and so I just wanna ask you to perhaps leave us with the final, uh, some final words, Jesse, before we pass it to Pamela to close. Sure. Um, remember when I was talking about homelessness is about a disconnection from our relations, right? So this is relationship to our identity, our kin, our land, as well as love, right? That was one of the things that was severed through specifically things like residential schools uh, did, really did a number on that. So the way back into the circle is through love, right? Is through reestablishing our kinship connections. And that's what that story is about. You know, my mom was my my research assistant, we want to like a long extended road trip so that we could get together and just get to know each other. And Carolyn paid for it with the government grant, right? And then they took me to the land and the land remembered me. And through that, I became whole, I found my identity, right? Because being indigenous, really, it is about biology, but it's really about how you are welcomed into the community and your reciprocal responsibilities back to the community and land. And so I tried to depict that, you know, and I'm still working on learning how to love myself and my community and my land. Uh, but through that route, 
you find yourself as an indigenous person. And I wrote the back end of the book, the last 60 pages about that quest back to myself. And what it really is, is the reestablishment of those broken relationships. And they're not all fixed. And some of them will never be fixed. I'm hoping that the work that I've done will benefit my niece, Alexa, will benefit my future kids so that they don't have to do this work, you know. And so that's, I'd like to leave it there because that's really what the book is about. Wow, thank you so much, Jesse. And thank you so much, Desiree. And I apologize to everyone for the late start. I encountered some technical difficulties, but just as, um, as, a, as a community, we all came together regardless. And I really appreciate, you know, Desi jumping in and, you know, Jesse sharing your remarkable work. And so thank you for this deep, you know, healing like discussion this afternoon. Um, in closing, I do hope you all enjoy these cultural Zoom events offered by UCLA American Indian Studies Center. If you wish to help us continue our work, please consider donating by visiting our webpage at aisc.ucla.edu. And please follow us on social media at UCLA AISC on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And this will conclude our afternoon book talk with Jesse Thistle. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, everybody. <laughs>